Good morning, men. Good morning. <coughs> so, for the first time ever that I can remember, we are not going to have a shout out this morning because Kimberly's on vacation and so <laughs> that's the way it worked out. So, we're going to uh, continue in this series, Jesus Unfiltered, this morning. We're going to take another look at the woman at the well this morning. The title of the message today is How You Can Easily Tell anyone about Jesus. So it's interesting. Um, I went to bed not really having a sense of passion about what I wanted to talk to you about this morning. So at the, I have this one page outline. I've told you about this many times that I use each week to make sure that I I'm on track in preparing a grace-based, application-oriented Bible study for you. And the very first bullet on here, after I pick a text, the very first bullet on this worksheet says, probe until I find the passion in the text, colon, what truth stirs me so deeply that I feel compelled to tell others about it immediately? Well, I didn't have that last night when I went to bed. And it's interesting because this happened several times here in the last few weeks. But the Holy Spirit has, has always been trustworthy for all of us, but I've experienced the trustworthiness of the Holy Spirit to always deliver. Now, sometimes uh, the message uh, really resonates with me. And uh, sometimes it really resonates with you, but sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but that doesn't mean it wasn't the message that the Holy Spirit wanted to have delivered that day. So I come to this message this morning finally feeling like I have something that I am so passionate about that I feel compelled to tell you about it immediately. Now, when I became a Christian, I was so in despair, uh, you'd, have, I, you'd have had to jack me up to bury me six feet. I was so far under the ground. It was terrible. There is a verse in Proverbs 13, that says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. That was me. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And when that longing was fulfilled, when, when finally I understood that there was a Savior, Reinhold Niebuhr, a very famous theologian who wrote uh, a book on the, the nature and destiny of man. It's the doc, he wrote the authoritative theological text on the doctrine of man. And Niebuhr, he's the one that wrote the serenity prayer too. All of you in recovery know the serenity prayer. You know, God grant me the serenity to whatever it is. But Niebuhr, <laughs> Niebuhr, <laughs> okay, God, Grant me the serenity to change the things that I can, uh, the, cur the courage to, the courage, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Yeah. Yay! Because I am in recovery too. <laughs> Niebuhr said this, he said, in cultures where a Messiah is not expected, people are not asking any questions for which Jesus is the answer. But you and I know that we need help. We need hope. We have hope deferred. It makes our hearts sick. We need someone to come and save us. And when I finally, I was, Jesus also said, he said, you know, 
when someone has a small debt forgiven, they have a small amount of gratitude. But when they have a, a huge debt forgiven, they have a, a big gratitude. And I had such a big debt, and I didn't even know there was a Savior. But when I finally understood that there was someone who could save me from, from myself, I was just so overwhelmed. It was crazy. It was crazy. And, and so I was like the, the, the biggest convert, enthusiast, evangelist there ever was. I mean, I, was, I, I just could not believe what had happened to me. I could not believe that I could be in such despair for most of my life. I quit high school. <laughs> I mean, the despair was overwhelming. I'm in the army. I'm driving, I'm driving to and from the post, and I'm, I'm weeping because I'm so depressed because life makes no sense. I even, I even then try going to church in the city where I was, but it was a church where the gospel was not preached and the Bible was not believed. And so uh, I remember going, none of this was in what I was planning to say, by the way. <laughs> but I remember going into the, the, the office of the, uh, of the pastor, the priest of that church, and sitting down, and I had sunglasses on because my eyes were so red I was embarrassed for him to see how much I'd been crying my eyes out, sobbing my, sobbing my sorry eyes out, my hope deferred eyes out. And I, I, I went in there to see if I could find God. And I didn't. He had a little twinkle in his eyes. He said, well, you know, Pat, we all go through hard times like this, but you're going to get through this. And I didn't. And I just felt like I was getting buried deeper and deeper, not six feet under, but 16 feet under. I just felt, I was, I felt like the, the mountain, I was not only down in the valley, but the mountain had collapsed on top of me. And so when I didn't find God, but when God found me, when he entered my life, I, I just went crazy. It's just like this sentence here at the top of my outline. What truth stirs me so deeply that I feel compelled to tell others about it immediately? And so I just basically, I went crazy. I was the, I was the nut. I became the nut you all tried to avoid. I would take, I just started inviting all my friends to lunch. That was my, that was my ammo. I, I took every one of my friends to lunch. Every single one of them. I said, you're not going to believe what happened to me. I could, let me tell you what happened to me. You're not going to believe it. And, and then a lot of them said, wow, nothing like that's ever happened to me. And they, and they could identify with the hope deferred because I was telling them, I, I told them, hey, here's, here's, here's how I was. Here, here's something that happened to me. And, and here's how I feel now about it. And they said, well, I want to feel that way too. And so I, I'd gone through a little course that taught me how to just read a little booklet, a little Campus Crusade booklet. I, so I would just read them the booklet. And then I just, there are a couple questions. I just say, I just ask them the questions. I just read them the questions. And then, and then I'd say, well, do, you know, do you want to become a follower of Jesus too? And, and most of the time they said yes. And so we had, we had a little revival among my friends. It was amazing. This Bible study in many ways came out of that. Because I just, but, but the, because then we needed to start having places to, we, need, we needed to have a place to talk about. Uh, what do we do next? Now what do we do? Now what do we do? And so I want to take you to a story, back to a story this morning, where something very similar to that is happening. How you can easily tell anyone about Jesus is the title of the topic. If you would, turn again to John chapter 4, but we're going to start at verse 27. 
And the first thing is something so compelling that you can't keep it in. I can't help every time I... Generational, I guess. Can't keep it in. Gotta let it out, Cat Stevens' <laughs> song. This is something so compelling you can't keep it in. Can't keep it in. So let's take a look and see what, what is happening here. So the conclusion of the conversation that Jesus has had with this woman was, in verse 25, the woman had said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. <laughs> in, in cultures where uh, a Messiah is not expected, People are not asking any questions for which Jesus is the answer. But in cultures where a Messiah is expected, people are asking questions. All right? And so she said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And so then the disciples, in verse 27, returned. They're surprised to find him talking with a woman. If you were here last week, you recall, she's a three-striker. She's a Samaritan, so, you know, like an ethnically, you know, like an Irish Catholic in New York at the turn of the 20th century. You know, just somebody people didn't like, you know. A low life, you know, I had a Samaritan, ah! And she was a woman. And uh, we talked a little bit about that, and she was uh, an immoral woman. Uh, she had had some, you know, five husbands living with a guy that wasn't her husband at the time. And so just then the disciples returned. They were surprised to find her talking with a woman, but no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town. So it's interesting, this woman had come, uh, come from the city to the well, and now she's going back a different person. She's going back a transformed person. Transformed by what? She's been transformed by an encounter with Jesus. Or let's just say, maybe perhaps it's a better thing to say, she's in the process of being transformed by the person of Jesus. Think about the city. A city where hope has been deferred. A city where the people are, are looked down upon. It's a community, uh, an ethnic community that's looked down upon. And so you have this city that's just going along and not knowing that anything is going to be different in the future. And you have a woman who's going out to get water in the middle of the day probably because she doesn't want to be around the other women because they're already, look <laughs> she's already among a look down upon people and she's a look down upon person <laughs> among a look down upon people. And she probably doesn't want to have any more ridicule or embarrassment or shame. So she goes out in the middle of the day to get water. And up until that moment in history, Hope has been deferred. And then she has this encounter with the Savior of the world, the visible image of the invisible God, the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of the Father's being. All the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. And she has this incredible encounter, this exchange with the creator who is at the side of the Father, the one who actually is the creator, the one who did the work of creating the cosmos, hurled the cosmos into existence, set the boundaries of the oceans to the shore, who regulates the rising and the setting of the sun and the ebb and the flow of the tides. And she talks to him and he talks to her. And he says, I who speak to you am he. And now, <laughs> look what it says. Then leaving her jar, of course she left her jar. Yep. 
It doesn't say she ran. She, it just says she went back in the town. But you can imagine the difference in what's going on inside of her as she is coming out versus going back in. Coming out, hope deferred with a heart sick. Going back in, a longing fulfilled, the tree of life. And she, she, <laughs> she's had something so compelling happen to her that she can't keep it in. And she goes back and look at what happens. She said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. And then because she has an incredible emotional intelligence, she doesn't say, you know, ah, come, could, you know, there's a man who told me everything I ever did. You need to know him. <laughs> she has high emotional intelligence. She said, could, could, this, could this be the Christ? Could this be the Messiah that we've been looking for? Could this be the one? Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. She invites them, and could this be the Christ? Could this be the Christ? And because... Well, we'll get to a little bit more about why they did this. But they came out of the town and made their way toward him. They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Something has happened to her. <clears throat> and she knew it was the real thing. We have, we live on a lake. We have a lot of osprey on our lake. About once every 10 years, an eagle comes by, you know. But every time I see an osprey flying around on the lake, I say, is that an eagle? Is that an eagle? But let me tell you, once an eagle shows up, you don't have to say, is that an eagle? You never have to wonder if an eagle is an eagle. You know it is an eagle. Rob took me fishing a couple of weeks ago at the Rodman Dam, and we had a two-hour long, or maybe it was a four-hour long, eagle show. It was amazing. I couldn't wait to tell you about it. I couldn't wait to tell you about it. And that's what happens when we have an encounter with the visible image of the invisible God. And that's the big idea today. I'm going to explode unless I can talk about what just happened. You see it with this woman. She's going to explode and she can't talk about what just happened. She leaves her jar. She rushes back in to town, a town where hope has been deferred. Can you imagine you probably can, but just, just picture how, how dull and how monotonous and how hopeless it probably felt to live in this, this community of looked down upon people. She rushes back into the city. And, and because of her enthusiasm, because she, because of her enthusiasm, because she felt like she was going to explode, like she couldn't wait to tell, because of that, that enthusiasm, they went. They went with her. It says, they came out of the town, and they made their way toward Jesus. And then there's a little excursus in here, which I think we'll come back to next week. But drop down to verse 39. And... <clears throat> What we see take place here is the first citywide crusade. It's an extraordinary thing. We're very early in the life of Jesus here. We know that he has invited some of the uh, uh, 12 to become disciples, some individual conversion stories. But what we have here is the first citywide crusade crusade. And what, and what has happened is that he's helped one person be transformed 
And that person is so compelled to talk to others about it that she becomes like the advance man for the crusade. You know, she's the crusade director. She's the one who's doing all this. She's the evangelist, advance person for this crusade. Verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony because she was so excited about what had happened to her and she's telling them, could, could this be the Christ? This man told me everything about myself, you know, about my past. He told me everything about myself. Yeah. Could this be the Christ? I think it's also appropriate to tell you that some scholars do think that in this uh, Greek word here, could this be the Christ in this, that there, there, there may have been still some, some uh, reservation on the part of the, the woman, and there probably was. I mean, I, if, you, if you had this encounter, uh, you know, with, with, with God, and, and you didn't think it was going to happen, and you're kind of surprised at that, it might take it a while for it to fully sink in to you. I know it took a while for, for it to sink in to me, really. Uh, yeah. So, so when I came to Christ, I mean, I, I, can't, I prayed the prayer. Finally, Howard Ball, some of you may remember that name. Finally, one day, some of the guys said, hey, Morley keeps coming to these events and praying to receive Jesus. Can you sit down and explain it to him? <laughs> and uh, so I, you know, I'd probably been to 10, 10 events and I, I kept praying to receive Jesus, you know, and he explained it to me. He said, you, know, you only have to do it, you only have to receive the gift once. I said, oh, okay, well, that's fine. And, but, and, and then I was off to the races. So that's probably a little bit what's going on here. But anyway, she still is so overwhelmed with what's going on, she can't keep it in. And so because of that, because of her testimony, it says, many believed, many believed. Verse 40, so when the Samaritans came to him, in other words, when they, when they uh, went to the stadium, where the crusade was being held, about to be held, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. And so, or the title is just how, how you can easily tell anyone about Jesus. You can, you can do what she did. You can just say, this man, here's, here's, here's what he's told me about myself. Could he be the Messiah? And then, and then, and or, you can, you can take them to the crusade. You can take them to your church. You can take them to this Bible study. You can take them somewhere where they can be brought into contact with him. It says, what does it say? What does it say? What does it say? It says, and because of his words, many more became believers. We talk about his words. We're not talking about with a little twinkle in her eye, oh, you, you, everybody goes through things like this, you'll be okay. Oh, come on. We talk about his words. And so, she told her story. They came out. Many believed because of her words. Many more believed when they, they were brought into contact with the words of Jesus. And by the way, when you bring people into this place or into a, a place where the Bible is taught, the Word of God is taught, Jesus is the Word of God. He is here. You, you from time to time must, or you wouldn't come back if you didn't, you must experience that sense of the presence of the Almighty. You must, you have to experience it or you wouldn't come back. I'm going to explode unless I can talk about what just happened. Huh. 
All right, so finally, how can we make our stories more compelling? All right, so this is where it gets tricky. This is where it gets tricky, because I want to give some tactics. But I, I will have failed you completely if you think it's about tactics. It is not principally something that you do. Telling others about Jesus. It's not principally something that you do. That would make it about performance. It's, it's principally, <laughs> and it's, honestly, it's not even principally because you love those people, although you do. You care about these people. But it's not even principally that they really need this new product that you've discovered. It's principally about you sensing the overwhelming degree with which Jesus loves you and has transformed your life and you know that he can do that for others. It's principally about a response to what he has done in your life. Hmm. It's a radical transformation. You just can't, and you just can't keep it in. You got to let it out. You feel it. You feel it. You got to talk about it. And so, with that as the caveat, let's talk about some tactics right here from the text. All right, so the first thing we see from her, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Personal transparency. Tactic number one is personal transparency. Uh, you can tell people about your doctrine and your theology and what you know and how many people will be converted by that. Hmm. Good luck with that. Or you can tell them what Jesus has done in your life. What you were like before Jesus. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. I was sick of heart. I had what Kierkegaard said, the sickness unto death. That was me. And then I had this encounter with, you, you call him Jesus, but now I call him the visible image of the invisible God. I used to call him Messiah or Lord, but, and he is. But now I say, you know, I have seen the Father because I have seen Jesus. I know. I don't just think I, about God. I have seen God. I know who he is. And as a result, this is what's happening. What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? I'm going to explode unless I can talk to you about what's just happened. So, personal transparency, tactic number one. And then number two, tactic is asking us, asking us, asking God to give us a love for the lost. That's a tactic it's just asking, okay, you don't care about lost people? I get it. I mean, there are a lot of really crummy people out there. I was in the gym. I may have even told you this one because this is too good. I can't believe it. If I haven't told you this one before, it was an error not to tell it to you sooner. But I was in the gym one day, and there's this big, giant, burly, hairy guy a monster, really, a beast. Yeah, he was a beast, just like you. And, uh, and uh, so he'd been over there, you know, curling 45-pound dumbbells, you know, like, you know, 25 curls, something like that. He was looking like he's got 
you know, plastic dumbbells in his hands. And uh, he's got the scowl on his face. I mean, he's a mean dude. You can tell he's a mean dude. Yeah, you can tell he's a mean dude because there's nobody within 25 feet of him. And, uh, he, and, and he walks over, and, uh, and we converge on the weight rack at about the time I'm, I'm putting back my five-pound dumbbells. And, <laughs> and he takes those 245s, and uh, the slots are marked with the weights, and he puts the 245s where the 220s are supposed to go. And then he looks up, and our eyes meet. <laughs> and he gives me that look. He's, he's just daring me. Just, I just dare you to say a spitting word about what just happened. So I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> What a jerk! And he's walking away, and I'm just overwhelmed. I don't know where it comes from. Yeah, I do know where it comes from, but it doesn't come from me. I am just overwhelmed with a love, a compassion for this, this guy. I just see so much pain in this guy that I'd like to have on my side if I ever got in a fight street, on the street. And... Uh, I just feel such a love for him. Just, so just pray for And I pray for that all the time. Pray for it. Tactic number two. Number one, person transfer. Tactic number two, just asking for a love for the lost. This woman, think about it. She left her jar behind her and she, she had such a love for the people in her city. She, ripped, she couldn't wait to get back to tell them what had just happened. All right? And uh, we're running out of time, so let me give you one more. Have a good question in your hip pocket. Have a good question in your hip pocket. Look at, look at what she did. She said, uh, she said, said, he told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Christ? That is, that's a great question. You know, you could tell people what happened to you and say, you know, this is what happened to me. You know, could this be? Could this be true? Could this be the Christ? Or the question I like to ask, the, I, I call it the golden question. You know, where are you on your spiritual journey today? Because, because what truth stirs me so deeply that I feel compelled to tell others about it immediately? Because when you have had a genuine encounter with Jesus, then you're, you're going to feel like this, the big idea. I'm going to explode unless I can talk about what just happened. So I hope that's where you are right now. And if you don't feel that way, then guess what? You might just want to consider spending some more time with Jesus. I told you all that I'm reading, this is the last thing. I told you all that I'm reading through, some of you were here to hear it, uh, I'm reading through the Gospels uh, once a month. I got the idea from Don. He's, he's been doing that for a long time. I, I, uh, I was reading through the Bible cover to cover every year. This year I'm not doing that. I'm reading the Gospels 12 times, 89 chapters. And I, and I, and I wrote in the margin here, <clears throat> I'm really getting to know Jesus. I'm really getting to know Jesus. So, <clears throat> either you're going to feel like you're going to explode unless you can talk about what's happened to you, <clears throat> or I just would encourage you just to really get to know Jesus more so that you feel this compelling desire. What is it? Something so compelling that you can't keep it in. Let's pray. Our dearest Father, Lord, Thank you so much for giving us Jesus. Jesus, <laughs> to, for, we, we, it's hard to understand, Lord, <laughs> that you are the Father, and the Father is you, and how does that work? Help us to fully grasp more of the depth of the gospel today through your words here, through your words here. And let us feel so gripped by the truth of what 
you have done for us that all the hope deferred that's made our heart sick has now become a tree of life. And Lord, for all the hopeless things that happen to us even though we are in Christ day by day, return our thoughts to the splendor of your gospel and then let this be the day in which we rejoice and are glad in it because we know that you are saving us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.